Hello. Hi, Kelly. How are you? Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, for those of um, us who may not be as familiar with your work, perhaps we could do a bit of an introduction. Um, I know you're an artist, uh, multidisciplinary artist, so I would like for you to tell us um, what your body of work is. Oh my goodness, that's fun. <laughs> um, I Well, I started in opera, musical theater, and theater. I was very interested in working in Stephen Sondheim-esque operetta. Mm -hmm. I moved to New York when I was quite young and performed in New York doing bizarro experimental theater in black box theaters, <laughs> confusing my mom all over the um, South Street Seaport and various places in New York. Uh, I was part of the Flea Theater, which is Sigourney Weaver and Jim Sim Simpson's experimental theater where they bring a company of actors together to do original work. So I did that for a couple of years. And um, then I moved to Toronto because the recession had hit and I wanted to um, work in film as well, or sort of Work in, work in a city where I could work both. And uh, Toronto, it has that incredible um, nature to it. So I moved to Toronto and started doing theater there as well. Worked with um, playwright Kat Sandler, who's sort of a local Toronto hero. And we did a bunch of original pieces. And, um, and then I wrote a film and sort of became a filmmaker via my first film, Play the Film, which is about a bunch of actors um, trying to make work for themselves. So obviously it was very meta. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got into filmmaking. And so I guess my body of work starts in, in theater and is sort of moves through um, various cities that I've lived in. But um, my film body of work is maybe more easily accessible because <laughs> <laughs> that's how it works with the film industry. But um, yeah, so I started working in film only about six years ago, five or six years ago. And before mm -hmm. that, it was mostly exclusively musical theater and theater. Excellent. So we're here to talk about your feature film, Sugar Daddy, which you wrote and you star in, and um, it's doing quite well in the festival circuit here in Canada. So congratulations. Also, congrats on the Canadian Screen Award nomination. So thank you. Very well earned. Very well earned. Um, so I've done a little bit of research about the film. I've seen the film, um, truth be told, twice now. Ooh. So, well, I also wanted to get the perspective of somebody else. Uh, I'm missing that from going to cinemas that we, mm -hmm. you know, we can kind of banter with our friends about what we see. And so I kind of recruited a friend to, to watch this with me as well, because I wanted a, a different point of view than my own. So um, maybe let's talk a little bit about the multi-layer that is Sugar Daddy. And um, I, it hit me a different in a different in different directions when I watched it both times, and um, I wanted to get your um, point of view on what was the impetus of telling this this story. Hmm. Uh, well, I wrote this film when I was really broke and working multiple part time jobs with very little um, end in sight. There was no career in sight. There was no letting up of the sort of lack of self-worth as a person and as an artist I was experiencing. And I stopped being able to see the various ways I was being commodified in every different part-time job that I had. And also with auditions and with performing as well, both of my gender, of my sexuality, of my prescribed femininity per se. And so it became sort of a, like I had sort of a thing I had to do. I, I hit an impasse and it became the thing I just needed to do to move forward. And that's what the impetus for this film was. And what you say about the multi-layeredness of it or how much we sort of tried to jam pack into the film, I wanted to try and capture the disorienting feeling that an artist experiences by not being able to unpack you know, how your self-worth is attached to money, is attached mm -hmm. to whether or not you're paid, is attached to whether or not you're attractive or whether or not you're fitting into the right silhouettes that they want you to. So I wanted it to kind of feel multi-layered and disorienting and confusing and conflating and buried under layers of, of things that I have since, and I think every, every woman at least can relate to since started unpacking is the, the confusing layers of your early 20s. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wanted it to feel like that. 
For sure. I mean, I do relate to the early 20s vibe of having three jobs and going to university. So it kind of did bring me back to those days when you weren't sure what was happening <laughs> uh, with rent. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I also did appreciate the fact that um, you weren't really uh, preachy about your stance on um, the sex work uh, portion of the story. I know the way that I took it was the film is the film title is very provocative, but it's not really about sugar daddies. No, um, it really is about your main character, Darren. And I think her journey through those really, like you said, tumultuous, confusing times of being mid twenties and not knowing what to do to do your, to create your art. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's what I got from, from the film mainly. That's uh well, that's really, it makes me really happy to hear that <laughs> because yeah, the title was definitely a provocative choice. It's sort of that more commodified, sparkly marketplace title. Um, so you sort of know, yes, this film is about, in some ways, sugar daddying or sugar babying. But, you know, it also catalogs the lead character's very confusing relationship with her father and her absent father and men in general. Mm -hmm. So it it is very down the barrel sugar daddy, but it also sort of recalls the undercurrents of her longing to fill this, to find approval from this father figure and also to therefore seek approval from all men, which is something she has to burn down throughout the film. Right. And in terms of, the conversation of sex work and commodific commodification of women. The film is not about like not about sex workers. It's not representing mm -hmm. sex workers. It's about all the other ways women are commodified that are confusing and non-linear and with consent, without consent. And we absolutely were not, we didn't attempt. And I don't think we ever in the film moralize the experience of sex work mm -hmm. or the various types of sugar daddying that one can do. Um, it's really actually about how, my, we kept saying how everything was sugar daddy, how everything, mm. how, how um, if a man buys you a, dr a drink at a bar, a woman feels that she owes him five minutes of yeah. the time. That's right. sugar daddy, that's what that is. Right. And me, me financing the film and trying to find money from, you know, from the industry that is dominated by and, and the gate the gatekeepers of it are dominated by rich older men it was that felt like sugar daddy that yeah. felt like me sitting across mm -hmm. from these men and being like I hope they know this isn't a date and this is just <laughs> me talking and mm -hmm. so it uh all those layers and 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 the sort of counterpoint of it is what we were going for so I'm happy that you picked up on that and <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think as women, as you said, um, or femmes, we know that that really is the experience that we've sort of known about since early age, actually, that, or at least maybe our tweens is when we start to connect the dots mm -hmm. a little bit about being commodified by our femininity or lack thereof. So um, I, I did pick up on that quite a bit. I, it also, what you just said reminded me of the scene in the film, which I know you've probably talked about in other interviews uh, with the birthday, it's Darren's birthday. I mean, to this point in the film, I have conflicted feelings about Darren, I'm not gonna lie. Um, yeah. But um, the way that the so-called open-minded friends were, um, acting or reacting with regards to her sugar daddy, uh, sugar baby work was, was quite interesting, but also quite timely. I feel like this is the time when we're actually having these discussions more than maybe when I was in my mid twenties, mm -hmm. um, which seems pretty true to nature. Yeah, we wanted to make this film for, you know, women, for femme, for young women, for young people to sort of say, to normalize conversations of sex work and, and commodification and normalize these things and present them as present them as a, as a conversation in all its complexities and all its struggles and all its embedded biases and judgment, and, you know, and, and I think uh, that moment was really important to me because you'll, you may notice that Darren pretty much stops talking throughout mm -hmm. that scene. And her privilege, you know, as a white woman gets kind of hung out to dry a little bit because yeah. here are all these other women who are sort of unpacking it from their own perspective and we for a brief and the men are completely they completely disappear from the scene they're in the scene in the beginning and then they kind yeah. of disappear mm -hmm. and uh csa nominated christine armstrong our editor mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and i we we edited that 
scene, it took us two and a half weeks, that scene, just to okay. edit that one bit. And the conversation of like, who's talking, who's reacting, and all those things filtered into an experience that I think I can relate to where you may think that you understand where your perspective is and what you would think. And then you get into a, a group of really smart and opinionated women who come from varying perspectives and you realize you haven't considered A, B, and C. You haven't considered right. this and that. And that is how we move the conversation of normalizing sex work and commodified you know, work in some sort of way. That's how we move it forward. Instead of just being like, it's bad, <laughs> which of course the film does not you know, position in any kind of way. Right, right. And I think that's, uh, that's what leads to hopefully more open discussions where you just leave it to the individual to, to, I guess, talk about their opinions on the matter rather yeah. than, you know, the film telling us how to feel or think, right? Yeah. And I, and I wonder how it will play in different parts of the mm -hmm. world. Because I, I know we had one reviewer say something like, you know, why isn't the conversation about whether or not it's right or wrong? Like, what, isn't that the conversation we're supposed to be having? And that is in itself flawed. It's like, if we're, we're supposed to be having, and I talk about this in terms of, you know, you watch movies of um, gang violence or okay. drugs or like, you know, male violence, and you're not coming out of a um, Scorsese film or a Quentin Tarantino film being like, is violence bad? Right. Or is male, you know, aggression bad? No, you're, you're sort of just, a, you're, you're having a good time watching it. Right. Um, but for some reason, when it comes to women expressing their sexuality or sex work or owning their sexuality in a way, it just undoes, it unravels everybody and it makes everyone so mad. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. It's, it's like, how dare you? Um, how dare, yeah. How dare you have <laughs> a bunch of women talking about the ins and outs of whether or not they would participate in something like this? It, and those are the conversations that inspire me. The female psyche is my muse and I mm -hmm. will continue to unpack it and try and put it on camera as much as I can. Yeah, I think it's great because as I mentioned, Darren is very conflicting as a character. You know, she does things that made me cringe for whatever mm -hmm. reason, you know, at different times. But then, then she does things where I'm like, I get it. I, I get it. I know what it's like being 25 and you're just trying to navigate the world as best as you can. Um, I also found it interesting, the relationship she has to other women, not just in the friend group, but like her sister and the Amanda Bugel um, character um, in the music, uh, especially that scene in the record recording studio. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about those two other characters? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing we worked the longest on in terms of Myself and my two incredible creative producers, Lauren Grant and Laura Lezinski and Wendy Morgan, the director. Mm -hmm. We did 78 drafts over the course of five years. And I think the one thing we worked the hardest on or that we kept chipping away at is how to make Darren a flawed female lead that you still root for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because we have so many examples of flawed male leads that you still root for. And I wanted it felt more natural to me to write a character that was maddening at times and that felt and replicated the feeling of when you look back at your early 20s and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. You know, <laughs> that's what I wanted to show. So it meant that she would make decisions that would make you want to pull your hair out. Um, and one of them is her complicated relationship with women. Because if you've been, because patriarchy brainwashes everybody, including women, it, it, mm -hmm. it soaks into our consciousness. So you have a young woman whose father has left at a young age and has left her this void where she's seeking approval by men. And therefore it's blinding her to the approval or the conversation or the connection she could have with women, which mm -hmm. is sort of the super arc of the whole film is her, her, is her dealing with that. Right. So when she meets Amanda Bruegel, Amanda Bruegel's character who Nancy, who plays this record studio owner and Amanda gives her incredible advice and right. is, is seeing her for who she is, Darren isn't able to recognize that that she has power or that she is someone she should listen to. Mm -hmm. um, I think Amanda's character is probably the most poignant and important character in the whole film because she's the one person who tells Darren what she needs to hear. Right. And you know, Darren is just being like, where are the guys at? Where did they go? And like, what is their opinion? And mm -hmm. um, so although I didn't want to represent, I really have a hard time watching female antagonism on camera. Like I hate that mm -hmm. sort of 
kind of male written portrayal of how women interact, I do understand the feeling of not, not being able to connect. I want to represent the feeling of not being able to connect with women because you've told yourself that only men's opinions matter. So, and then also with her sister, her sister, Darren is making all these complicated choices. Mm -hmm. And yet when her sister makes a pseudo complicated choice, Darren loses her mind. Right. So again, it's like, what is what she's willing to say yes to? She's not, doesn't want her younger sister to say yes to. Exactly. So again, the complexity, complexities and the, the flaws <laughs> of working in your early twenties as a right. performatively female person. It's just very, <laughs> It's just a, a difficult thing to unpack, but we tried in the film. Yeah, I know. And I think it's important to see also the dynamic in terms of, you know, um, Amanda's character. It, she is sort of an older woman trying to, you know, embrace Darren in a way, you know, albeit from a distance, but um, that happens to us as we get older, right? We, we want a mentor and, and there are times when um, our young, you know, young women in our lives are not quite ready for that. So mm -hmm. it's like knowing when to kind of say, okay, it's, take your time. <laughs> I imagine, I imagine that if I imagine Darren, like five years from now, after the film ends, I think of her, like thinking about what Amanda Bruegel's character told her and being like, ah, oh, okay. Okay. I, <laughs> I wasn't ready. I understand. <laughs> so yeah, that exactly. was kind of, yeah. Thinking about Darren's future, it sort of helped craft that whole, that whole arc. Yeah, it makes sense. And I, I do appreciate these multi layers, as I mentioned earlier, it, but even within this, the side characters, you know, the women in her life that maybe we don't really get to know as much, but we kind of pick up that there is there's something there that that, that could be explored. And I think that really leaves it to us as audience members to, mm -hmm. to kind of figure it out. Um, the same thing with the father, I, I I realized there wasn't much about Darren's father in the story. And, and then at first, it kind of seemed um, something that I wanted to know more about, but as, as I sat with the film or after the film and I, and I hear you talk about it, it kind of makes sense why there's not much there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's definitely like the father's quite literally out of the picture. He's mm -hmm. out of the film. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know a better way to express someone's absence by quite literally showing their absence right. than mm -hmm. being present. Um, but it's something that in the first, you know, couple minutes of the film, you see her searching for him and you know there's a reference to him and then mm -hmm. she, she sort of talks about it with her relationship with Gordon but it yeah. is that undercurrent that want that pain that wound that drives her to seek approval from men her whole life and then ultimately mm -hmm. hopefully shift that towards women to her mother to the god of creation you know that sort right. of thing. That was where we were working with was like how she's moving her her power from paternal power to maternal power to maternal power that's great um i'm not gonna um ignore your casting especially in terms of the the men that she meets in her life we have peter her roommate it's another conflicting relationship <laughs> and then um sugar, the sugar daddies uh, um play, i should mention is ishan dave right is mm -hmm. that i pronounce the yeah. name right um is peter and um I do want to mention, obviously, Confior and Nicholas Campbell as the sugar daddies uh, in the film. And the moments of cringe, but also these guys are kind of sad and lonely, you know? And, yeah. and I think you picked up from, uh, you picked up um, that kind of sense from Peter as well. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was interesting to see that as well. We didn't want to portray any of these men as one-dimensional, like, creepy guys who, you know, are just doing this because they're lonely necessarily because gender is a huge undercurrent in all of my work and in this film as well and the insecurities that these men feel and the expectations on their performative masculinity are tragic right. and so you have you have someone like Peter her roommate who has feelings for Darren but has is being has been taught that that means that he should therefore have some sort of ownership of him, of her. That's not necessarily his fault, but it's just the culture that he grew up in and, 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 and the culture that I grew up in where, you know, you hear these terms like friend zone and whatnot. Right, yeah. um, and then you have like Nicholas Campbell, who is trying to reinvent a scenario, perhaps with his deceased wife and connect over awesome. classical music. 
And that is so tragic. And then of course, Colin Fior playing Gordon, who is trying to reconcile his absent relationship with his daughter mm -hmm. in, in being a mentor to Darren and a right. friend. But of course, the ways in which we sort of fill a void and, and that people have left in us are very confusing and pseudo-sexual and, 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 and uncomfortable and cringy, mm -hmm. you say. So yeah. um, it was important to me that all those three male characters felt real and multidimensional and the actors that we had, Ishan and Nicholas and Colin playing those roles were just mm -hmm. a dream come true. And they were so game and especially like Ishan talking with him about the character and his, he was really uncomfortable with the right. kind of way in which Peter behaved. And he was like, this is not normal for me. This is, <laughs> he's a deeply feminist, sensitive mm -hmm. human being. <laughs> and he's right. like trying to, but he's also, he's like, I've heard men talk like this. I know people do. So it's the question of asking men to, 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 to lean into wanting to portray these types of roles and investigate what's going on within them. For sure. No, I appreciate that. I kind of, um, I'm mindful of time, but I, I, I love the sound editing in the film. It's something I took a note of um, early on. But I also want to talk about the art direction and the switch in terms of, you know, there's a beautiful scene, La Camosa is playing in the background. And then we see um, this Nichols Campbell and yourself in the car. And it switches to something really beautifully uh, done in an artistic way. Uh, can you talk about those, those um, sort of lapses in time? I don't know what to call them. Is it a fantasy? Mm -hmm. Is it a dream? We call them like imagination spaces. Mm -hmm. or we at one point referred to them just as the black void because she okay. the black void. Mm -hmm. um, and the person I have to credit for that is um, production designer, Jessie Jerome. In one of her early lookbooks, she had this sort of woman on the ground looking at the glass and it's sort of reflecting this kind of inner cavity within our, ourselves that your brain can kind of return to because we want. I wanted to show an artist in the creative process and not show them with like audiences clapping and, and yeah. giving the validation. It's like, she's giving herself validation the whole time. So mm -hmm. we wanted to create a space where her imagination sort of lived. So on top of the car, the costume designer and I referred to that as um, the car Pieta. Cause she's mm -hmm. like sitting in the car with Nicholas Campbell and imagining if she had all the resources, this is what her sort of music video moment would be, mm -hmm. would be like Virgin Mary-esque dress right. on top of the car. <laughs> um, and, and so they all became these kind of kaleidoscopes of self-expression and um, reinvention. And so, and they all lead up to her um, identifying what her persona is, what her performance look is, who she is going to enter the world as, because this film is not a rise to fame story. It's like the year before. It's the, right. the prequel, the prequel to a rise to fame mm -hmm. story. It's the rise to self. It's it's the, the stuff that happens alone in your room before you really put yourself out there. So I, I assume that if if this was a real world, audiences would know Darren at the end of the film. They would right. be like, that's how she's introduced. Mm -hmm. But this is the year that had to happen in order for her to get to that point. Right. So that's what we were trying to, we, we wanted to make a space that was um, like a, a fixture of that imagination. Right, because it does leave me wanting to see more of that, of that side of Darren. I mean, yeah, because I do like, I do like the fact that it, it took me out of what I was expecting from Darren into more like, oh, so this is who you are. And, and this is the kind of artist that I, you're trying to be. I think that's what I got from those those really nicely done scenes. I'm also um, curious about the aspect ratio um, mm -hmm. of the film. Um, was that a decision that was done uh, post production or? Oh no no, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so. But <laughs> um, we uh, we made that decision in our um, when we were screen testing and trying out different lenses. Okay. Uh, myself and Wendy Morgan and our incredible uh, DP Kristen Fieldhouse just sort of we're trying out lenses, taking a look, thinking about it. And Wendy comes from like an art history background. So mm -hmm. she was interested in investigating like classical portraiture. And we just started talking about the fact that this is about, this is a portrait of a woman. This is her framing herself and visualizing herself and, and investigating herself. So a really tight 
classic frame was sort of where what we thought was most honest to her experience. And it also meant that when Darren's alone, she's well framed. When she's alone, it's just her face. Mm -hmm. It's like we feel the power of it. But when she's sharing the screen with one other person, it's like they both sort of don't fit and there's a tension. So it was a visual representation of um, what it means for a woman to seek her power through men, through another person, what it means to give her power away. Because when she's trying to fit both of them into the screen, neither of them fit. It just becomes the sort of visual tension. And But when she's alone, it's like, you know, a classical painting framing. So that's kind of the general reason why we went with that. Um, and it also creates a, a nice sense of claustrophobia, which is again, what I wanted to replicate from my early twenties. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. No, I appreciate you sharing about that because there's so many elements happening on, on, on screen that, you know, I'm, I'm that person that's sort of trying to pick out or trying to think, why would they do that? You know, or mm -hmm. what, what am I supposed to be experiencing through the music or through the visuals? Um, I really mm -hmm. like the change in color and tones as well um, um, through the film. So I do appreciate all the work that you've done. Oh man, that thanks. Sense. Yeah. And I will just say like, it, it's not just me, it's every, oh, it's a team, every, sure. every department, like our costume designer, Mara Ziegler, production designer, Jesse Jerome, Christine Armstrong, our editor, Kristen Fieldhouse, our DP, um, like Rosalind Assisto, our colorist, like Adam Steen, our sound designer, like every single person, um, like Marie De Delane Halorn, our Marie Helene Delorme, our musician, AKA mm -hmm. Foxtrot. It's like every single one of these people, these women, these allies, basically, um, sorry, that's my phone. Mm -hmm. um, basically every single one of them uh, like took it upon themselves to make this a like a radical expression of themselves as well and every detail was there was no detail spared like it was every single detail we, we we've infused power and meaning into and that's just a testament to the collaboration of this film um, my two producers uh, have been with this for five years and so every choice we made they knew it was soaked in five years of discussions and things like that. So it just got to a point where we couldn't make a decision without it being intimate and detailed and specific and raw. So I appreciate you picking up on them because they all came from such a hardworking place. No, oh, of course, and it shows. And I, and I think one of the notes that I wrote for myself is like, I wanna see more of this. I wanna see where, uh, you know, as a team, all of you are, are moving uh, towards next, but congratulations on the release. I know, it, it, I think it's tomorrow. Yeah. Six. Um, so I'm gonna make sure I, I link up to um, the socials for the film. And uh, is there anything you wanna plug for yourself before we close? Just this film. <laughs> <laughs> all Excellent. this film is all I'm thinking about right now. So I will plug at Sugar Daddy Film on all platforms and follow me at Kelly and Phyllis, but also just follow the film. And yeah, like just follow all the collaborators because every single one of them is so talented and they all put so much sweat and blood into this. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kelly. This was great. Thank you so much for chatting. It was really lovely.